Good. All right. So how was your first time with Sangor? Any comments or questions you want to bring to the table before we start? <laughs> Allegre, pretty lit. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Allegre? <laughs> Um, well, he, well, because he does, you know, talk about like, he does like, like touch and march in a thought and does touch on like the exploitation of capitalism, which I find like super like base because we haven't heard like, like this stuff, like actual first time in this class about like the problems of like, of the, of the system. And he, it's really interesting, honestly. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yes, absolutely. He's going there. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, actually, yes, to sort of add upon that, um, when it comes to Senghor and how he uh, approaches, um, you know, negritude and specifically the spread of African socialism, um, he makes a note of how, um, you know, um, like socialism as well it was known did have this sort of European context to it. Um, and you know, he makes it clear, like in the African mode of socialism, how um, he doesn't really want, you know, Africa to follow this mode of like, you know, the, um, the Second International or something. He, um, he's aware that, you know, Africa is in um, a certain situation compared to Europeans, whereas, um, you know, Africa is in this unique situation of being, um, uh, being under strictly a colonial identity. So uh, they have to sort of find this um, new uh, branch of socialism that, um addresses the uh, colonial uh, uh um specific colonial uh, capitalist exploitation and to sort of um you know bring in this new african identity uh to socialism to um make it more appealing to um africans yeah and i thought that was actually cool right we need to contextualize if we're gonna take from europe we need to contextualize it right we're not just gonna blindly imitate that's one of the main good things about his philosophy. Allegra, you have something else to add? Oh yeah, I do have a question. So he's not advocating for like this total hierarchy, but he's not advocating for like total like collectivization like in like in the two systems. So wouldn't he be for like this like decentralized government where like um like not like the people's like everything is be democratized, like the workplace is democratized where like he did say like economic democracy also. So would he be like advocating for like something decentralized? Like yeah, as a government. I mean, if you look even today at African government, right, there is the state of head of state, but there's also the elders, right? So they still have this concept that, you know, government should be, uh, what's the word, um, diffused, <laughs> right? So you do have, um, you know, um, the parliament, they, they imitate the British or French model, but they also have a system of elders, which are also part of the decision-making process and so forth. So they are kind of more decentralized. Yes, already naturally and still today, right? Even though they have adopted some of the European stuff, they keep, <laughs> they do have this system of elders still going on. <laughs> okay, because I, because I would imagine like the societies be like more like communal, like everybody be helping each other. But like, as like the like a bigger picture, be like more decentralized, where like a group can come together and like agree on something. That's yeah, what so, I envisions. So if you want to do social change in Africa, you go to the communities. You don't go to the government. Yeah, <laughs> right. Bureaucracy. Somebody like uh, Wangari Maathai, who was an environmentalist, right? In um, I'm typing her name in Kenya. She would go directly to the communities, talk to the elders, and get things done on that level, <laughs> right? So you do have a good system of community rule and you have like leaders in the different communities that you can go directly to because often to be honest the government has issues sometimes right <laughs> on the continent of africa so you but however the communities are working very well so that's one way right the, the grassroots is much more possible in africa because you have these communities that are very tight-knit and that have some kind of leadership of it so yes that would be the way to proceed <laughs> uh, so he'd be like a like a libertarian socialist or um so we'll talk about that right we'll talk about the socialism his version right of socialism which is not going to follow the soviet union model right um 
maybe in the sense of it's a socialism definitely which maintains the the human particularity which is not what you have in the soviet union soviet union you have to blend you have to basically think alike act alike and then you have this kind of homogeneity which makes things more efficient right in the african context the way he wants to apply socialism we'll see is that the particularities remain and are very important and we'll talk about this today also with regards to the civilization of the universal what does the universal mean in his mind right um good anything else one last comment before we get into the text all right good so i'm gonna talk about four things here's the outline number one the importance of negritude Number two, the text was pretty easy, but there are some interesting points that I want to highlight. Criticism of the Western materialism and individualism. Ah, oh, the planes are back. Each time I'm teaching this class, I have to deal with this. Okay, the quantum revolution. Revolution, sorry, spelled wrong. You know what I mean. Um, number four. The African version of individual and community. Wow, that was exhausting. Okay, good. Let's get into the first one. So we see already first part, very easy, right? We are dealing with post-colonial reflection, right? You can see that Senghor, right, was part of a group of black students to go to study in Paris. Um, and they were, of course, um, awakening right to the way that the french had imposed their worldview their structures uh and and they were saying you know we need to in a way recover who we are and it's true you know france comes to those countries and um basically says you know if you want to be civilized you have to learn french and go to french schools and they're really good schools right it's true these are amazing schools everyone wants to go there right if you want to be part of the elite you go to a french school you don't go to a public school so on the one hand right you have this um a gift <laughs> that the french are giving uh, their education system is very good but on the other hand right you have this underlying idea that well we are superior and if you want to be civilized you have to follow us right and so that's where they are now fighting off this idea obviously you know this i don't need to go too much into detail with this concept of negritude right and of course um the so let's look at a couple of of quotes on that um We can look at, at the last paragraph, we can underline that. Can you guys hear me? Like right now, can you hear me? Put your hand in this, you, you, do you hear the well, play? You're hearing the play? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> we still hear you though. It's not deafening though, right? Like for me, you don't it's have- It's not deafening, right? no. Okay, <laughs> all right, great. Okay, so last paragraph of page nine, right? We had been taught by our French masters at the Lycée. The Lycée is the French high school. That we had no civilization having been left off the list of guests at the banquet of the universal, right? We were tabula rasa, so we were pure matter that was needed, needing to be shaped, right? Or better still, here we go, a lump of soft wax, <laughs> which the fingers of the white demiurge, right? The creator, the white creator could mold into shape. The only hope of salvation you could hold out to us was to let ourselves be assimilated. Absolutely true, <laughs> right? This is what happens in the French colonies. Um, so yeah, so he continues now and he goes into this uh, reaction, right? The, the concept of negritude. So here we are in page 11 and uh, go to the last paragraph. We talked about this before, but I'll emphasize it again. He's gonna define negritude. I ought at this point, are you there? Last paragraph of 11, put your hand in the screen. And the rest of you turn on your cameras, please. Osorio, Coco, Pane, Sosa, Wu, Larson. Uh I'm in my brother. I'm in my brother's place, and I don't have uh, All right. uh, my camera with me. That's cool. No worries. Yeah, my okay. internet is really, really bad. So, like, you guys are frozen for me. I literally can't. <laughs> okay. Can I hear you guys? All right. No worries. Okay. So, last paragraph of eleven. I ought at this point you may think to define negritude. Well, negritude 
is the whole complex of civilized values. I think Hal Murad mentioned this in his paper and, and I also mentioned it last time. He's not saying these are primitive values, you're right, that we have in our primitive societies. He's saying these are civilized values. We are civilized, right? This is, we are also civilization. Even though we don't have all of the technology and the, the material, uh, you know, prosperity that you have doesn't make us less civilized. What he's saying is that you think you're a civilized because you have material wealth, but is that really a sign of civilization, right? Is not civilization, does not civilization have to do with the quality of the people's spirit versus the quality of their material prosperity, right? For too long, the West has thought of itself as civilized because it has technology, right? But is this the right definition of civilization, right? Is civilization about having or is it about being, right? And if you understand civilization about as being, as a way of being, which is civilized, to be honest, the African cultures, they, they, we are eating their dust, <laughs> right? So let me say that again, right? It depends what you mean by civilization. Is civilization, okay, I can't write civilization. Civilization, is it having? or being, right? For too long, the West has assimilated civilization with having, having technology, having prosperity, having money, having power, right? They have not seen it as who are we as human beings? Are we civilized as human beings, right? And what a lot of African thinkers are saying is that true civilization has to do with the quality of the people, right? Not with the quality of your house and your car and your technology, right? Who are you as a human being, right? Are you civilized as a human being? Are you capable of relating with other human beings in a civilized way, right? So that's where the issue is. So he's saying we are just as civilized, even if we don't have all the technology, we have civilized values, <laughs> right? Um, that you could learn from, obviously. So he continues. Um, Right, the whole complex of civilized values, cultural, economic, social, political, which characterizes the black peoples or more precisely the Negro African world, right? Now, here's where he becomes very interesting. All these values, he says, are essentially informed by intuitive reason, which he contrasts, right, with discursive reason. Um, let's read this whole paragraph. <laughs> Because the sentient reason, the reason which comes to grips, expresses itself emotionally through that self-surrender, that coalescence of subject. We'll come back to all of this, right? But this is, he's talking about the difference between intuitive reason and discursive reason. Now, where do we see this distinction in the history of philosophy? There is a philosopher, he's alluding to him who makes the distinction between discursive reason and intuitive reason. Who knows the answer? And if you're a Burstein fan, you would know. <laughs> well, now. No, not Kant. We didn't study him. <laughs> Remember, I gave you a hint. You're a Burstein fan, you know. Burstein being the professor here at Queen's College, who teaches what, mostly? <laughs> don't know okay guys guys <laughs> plato what kind of majors are you if you, <laughs> if you don't know plato everybody has the assignment of taking one class by burstein i'm writing his name this is on plato you cannot do philosophy without plato at least western philosophy he's alluding to him right for plato there is levels of knowledge very low is opinion little better is belief then you have intellectual reason, right? Subject, object, the detached subject who knows and masters the material. But then you have a higher form of reason, which he is saying the African people have. <laughs> Intuitive reason, which is basically you are in direct contact, you know in your flesh and your blood the topic. So you are in a way don't, in, in a much more intimate connection with the object than the one who is just knowing intellectually, right? So here he's, a, a, and it's, it would be interesting to develop. I mean, I'm not going to develop it, but this is an interesting direction to say that in a way, the African reason is not inferior, right? Or primitive, but actually this is what he's doing, superior. Okay, so we, we can accept it or not, but it's an interesting reversal, right? If you're, if you're familiar with colonial discourse, you know 
that we are constantly talking about, you know, reason and European reason as being far more sophisticated than the primitive forms of knowledge and art and music that we find. So he's kind of here with a, with a smile or a, a kind of ironic smile. He's reversing and saying, actually, <laughs> what you thought was primitive is actually much more evolved. It's on the highest end of the spectrum in the Platonic understanding of knowledge. So I would invite you, if you're interested, explore what Plato meant by intuitive reason, and this is where he's going with that, right? Um, good. Okay, uh, we'll talk more about this way of knowing in a second and why it's, it's actually very, um, a, uh, how shall I put it? Um, yeah, it's a very important way. Uh, the way that, uh, to know in this way is actually very uh, important and we'll see that in a second. Okay, right now we're just glazing through until we get the important part to the important part. So after this, right, he's doing now the criticism, which all of you certainly understood of um, materialism and he's criticizing both capitalism and socialism right we can read here on page 14 um, so uh, we haven't yet gone too deep into what it what it means negritude what are these values we're going to get to that right i'm just saying why he talks in this way why this is important okay so here he's talking on page 14 he's criticizing capitalism um, and I'm uh, here, I'm, uh, okay, you see the last paragraph, right in the middle you have because capitalism works, who is there? Put your hand in the screen, last paragraph right in the middle, okay, this is his main criticism, right, because capitalism works only for the well-being of a minority, here is the problem. Now, he's not making an ethical argument, he's making an argument from evolution. We're gonna talk about that in a second, right? In other, so let me summarize. In essence, what he's seeing with capitalism is that inherently, so we can say a lot of good things about capitalism and he does that, right? He says, yes, it's brought us some kind of, some you know, level of progress. The idea of comp competition is healthy, right? And so forth. Uh, but there's one issue with capitalism, which is inherent, I'm on page 14 last paragraph right inherent to capitalism is the accumulation of capital how do you accumulate capital you accumulate capital by you know taking it away <laughs> from whoever is working for you right if you look at any corporation this is the principle how do, how are we going to be more productive well we will pay the workers less and that way we can make more profit and we can accumulate more capital. This is inherent to capitalism, is this idea that how can I make the most money out of my workers? And of course, this will occur at the detriment of the workers. And we see this everywhere. You can just look here at the minimum wage in this country and tell me if there is not a huge aberration, right? Minimum wage, you cannot even work one job and survive. You have to have three jobs because of the way that the wages are, right? And the corporations which are giving these minimum, these tiny wages, they are huge multi-billion multi -billion corporations, right? That's their secret. <laughs> That's how they got there, right? So he's saying this is a problem, not just ethical. It's a problem which, which is which in a way is becoming a hindrance to civilization, to the... To the to the movement towards a more civilized world. Can anyone tell me why, based on what we talked about with Teilhard de Chardin yesterday, why is it that when some, only a minority has a well-being and not everyone else, why are we hindering our movement towards civilization? Can anyone tell me based on what we did last time? This is what he's saying here between the lines. <laughs> um, what did we see progress was for Chardin? What's the definition of progress? When are we the most civilized? Allegri, go ahead. I will take a stab at this. Um, I think progress is like turning to like unity to more of like, we don't act as individuals, but we turn into more community. So the problem with capitalism that it only it's only, it only works for the people at the very top while leaving the people the rest at like very meager means. It doesn't help, it doesn't help as a like a collective, like as a, like an organism, you're actually like depriving them of what they really need to do or need to specialize. Very good. Uh, King, you wanna add? Yeah, I'm on the same page with Allegri. 
instead of having 1% who's, you know, at that top, it, it would be better to have, you know, everybody, let's say on a lower playing field, but, you know, all, all working together as a, a bigger consciousness. Because exactly. He, he, he prioritized um, community and consciousness as, you know, being more important. Exactly, right? Remember, the more complex the organism, the higher level of consciousness. If you just have one elite, you have a tiny organism, right? The more people you add who are functioning, right? Not just sitting there dead, right? The more people you add who are functioning, the more complex, therefore the more conscious, therefore the more civilized. Make sure you write this down. This is, in, this is the problem with capitalism, right? Not that it's mean to the poor, right? No, it's not that it's mean or unjust or unfair. Yes, that too. But the main issue is that we are slowing down our progress towards civilization as a society. If you have only one little clump who are doing well, you have a tiny organism, right? The more people you add who are flourishing, the more complex, therefore the more conscious, and therefore the more civilized. And so this is the, this is, you can compare it to the human body. If in your human body, only your lungs work, but your stomach doesn't work, and neither do your eyes, and your hands are not so good, how are you? How are the lungs? <laughs> are they doing as good as they would if you had good hands and good legs and good stomach? Tell me. Yeah, uh, yes, let's see who raised their hand. Uh, King, go ahead. Um, so in video games, there's this thing called min-maxing where you put all of your you know, growth or attribute points into just one category in hopes of having a really strong character. But in in most cases, that doesn't work too often. And especially in life, it, it just doesn't work. Where you, you want to develop um, evenly. And yeah, you just want to develop evenly. It wouldn't make sense to have a really, really strong, you know, left leg. Because that's just not going to help the whole body. You got it. Right, this idea, I love the way you put it, to develop evenly. If you have a strong left leg and your right leg isn't strong, you're not gonna go very far. This is what he's saying. He's seeing community as an organism. And if one part of the organism is not functioning, the whole organism is not functioning as well as it could. And that's why he's saying capitalism is shooting itself in the foot. Because just having a minority on the top, not gonna bring us any, they're not going to progress as far as they could if everybody was on board, right? Allegra, do you have something to add? <laughs> oh yeah, I agree with King. That was a really good, um, and that, that was a really good analogy. But I was imagining like a person with like the best kind of lugs, but like with really weak legs. He's not gonna get that far. Exactly. He has like, he could like breathe a much, but what the, what's the point of it? Yeah. He has to be like developed equally. That's the idea. So as a society, in a way, we are hindering our own progress by keeping people down and having just one small elite going, doing well, right? So that's what he's saying. And because capitalism inherently is about keeping people down in order to make profit, he's saying this is not a viable option unless we completely change the way we do it, right? So that's the idea. Now, he's also criticizing socialism, right? Because, and here he has an issue with, uh, he says this on page 16, we can go there. He, 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 he calls it, uh, he, uh, he, what's the word? Uh, he contrasts the African view of socialism with the USSR view of socialism. And he's saying, we are not going to be collectivist. Collectivist, yeah, collectivist. We are going to be communal. Go to the second paragraph, the last, the last sentence, uh, a community-based, who is there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, a community-based society, communal, not collectivist. I'll come back to that. We are concerned here not with a mere collection of individuals, but with people conspiring together and we'll come back to this idea, right? So in the Soviet Union, you have masses of people who are in a way, uh, Think, at least at the time, right, thinking alike so that they can be more efficient, right? There, there is a homogeneity, which is encouraged, right? Uh, and so you have just a number of identical individuals doing this, you know, bringing things forward. He's saying, no, we want communal, 
And this is going to be very different because this will imply, this will in a way be protective of the individual differences. We need those differences in order to progress as a society. So this is where he criticizes the socialist model. Okay, make sure you get this, right? In socialism, there is the emphasis on sameness. Let us all believe the same, go in the same direction, no confrontation, no conflict, no dissent, no funny ideas, right? No differences. The more homogenous we are, right, the more efficient we will be. It works wonderfully to create economic growth. Example, China. Excellent, <laughs> right? Everyone is disciplined. Everyone is in order. Nobody has funky ideas. It's, it's going really well in terms of economic growth, right? Very efficient. But what, what Senghor is saying is that true civilization is not about only economic growth. It's about spiritual, it's about consciousness, right? And you can't have consciousness if you have homogenous society. Consciousness comes with complexity. Complexity implies the coexistence of differences. Are you following me? This is very important. Uh, put your hand in the screen if you're seeing. Let me say it again, right? You can't have consciousness, right? You can have certainly material prosperity when you have a homogene homo homogenous society, right? But you don't have consciousness. Consciousness comes with complexity, remember? And complexity implies the coexistence of different entities, right? And it is in this coexistence that you have true complexity and therefore this explosion of consciousness. So he's saying we are again limiting ourselves by wanting everyone to think the same and act the same and fit within this certain mold. And anyone who's a little different, we, we re-educate them or exile them. You can pick, <laughs> right? We are missing, we are in a way holding back on the amount of consciousness we could have as a society. So same criticism now to, of course, uh, USSR at the time. Um, Allegri, go ahead, young question. I mean, actually this, this like, re this actually makes sense because we were not like a hive mind. We all think differently. We all have like different types of individuality and different opinions. But like, if we try to take away that, we're basically taking away what like actually makes us humans or what like our thinking process yeah absolutely and you're taking away all of the different ideas that could be on the table but now they can't because they're censored right so so this is great because both sides have been bashing each other right the socialists have been bashing the capitalists the capitalists but actually both have a problem right here we are saying oh well we have we have human rights and we have democracy and we have you know free speech but what we don't have according to Senghor is a genuine a society which is equally developed, flourishing on an equal level, right? We don't have even development, like um, uh, King was saying, right? So we're bashing them, but we have our problems. But likewise, they're bashing us, but they have their problems too, right? So both have an issue, and that's why Senghor is wanting to pick a different path. He's going to opt for socialism, but an African version, and we're going to see what that means, right? Okay. Um, Good. So let's go now. Now he's going to move towards the African values, right? Now we're, on, we're after he has criticized a little bit, he's going to enter into what does it mean, this negritude, this, this set of values, and what is he basing himself on? And remember, I told you he was going to draw from the philosophy of Chardin. And of course, he's going to draw, he's going to allude to the, um, uh, the findings of contemporary physics, right? So I'm not going to go too deep into contemporary physics, but uh, let me start. This is the third section, right, of what we're going to talk about, the quantum revolution. You should look it up. <laughs> what, what, is, what is fascinating about um, this revolution in physics, which Einstein started and now is continuing, is this, the shift, I mean, really, the Copernican shift, you could say, of an understanding of the substance of life. Right? For so many years, centuries, we had thought that life is made of matter, dense, material, right? And that it is the material, this dense matter, which is the substance of life. And with Einstein and now with quantum theory, we are shifting to seeing energy as being the substance of life. In fact, matter being made of energy or having the properties of energy. We know this from some of the experiments, right? That matter is acting like a wave. If you remember this, this uh, test, I am forgetting the, the, the name of the test, but they were testing to see if, if um, 
matter acted like a wave or like particles and they have both <laughs> right so you have here uh, more and more we are discovering that the basis of life is not so much this dense matter but energy spirit you could say right so the so you can look into it right i really invite you to look into i mean you have this the famous quotes i mean famous quote <laughs> famous formula by uh what's his name um uh, einstein right uh energy equals mass times uh, speed, right? So you can see this, there's an equivalence, right? Which is, which we never would have thought. We used to dissociate them. We used to say there is a matter and then, you know, the body and the soul, they say they're, they're intertwined, right? Energy is the stuff of the universe. So of course, Senghor, right, is going to jump on that because he's saying, well, that's what we Africans have been saying, right? Uh, yes, exactly, Allegri, the particle duality. In other words, particles act both like waves and like particles at times, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's strange. <laughs> I, I forgot the name of the experiment um, where they put some particles through a little crack to see how they act on the screen. And when they look at the particles, they notice that they have a wave like, uh, thank you, double slit experiment. Thank you, Hamurad. Please, everybody, look into that. This is one of the main experiments, which seems to imply that matter is behaving like energy, like a wave, right? This is insane, right? We're not used to matter acting like energy, but apparently there is they're intertwined, right? It's, it's so, so that's, so, so Sangor, of course, is rejoicing. He's like, that's what we Africans have been saying forever. We've been saying the stuff of life is spirit. It's not matter, right? So this is just that you have the difference between the West and the African mindset, because the Western is a primordially materialistic society. Our highest values are material. Now, if you're shifting to a view of the universe as essentially spirit or consciousness, everything else that comes out of that is going to be completely different. The ethics will be different. The laws will be different. The politics will be different, right? And we're going to see some of that in a second, right? So we're there. And of course, you have what we talked about with Chardin, right? That we are moving towards greater and greater consciousness, right? Through the complexification. So all of these, these are the scientific basis, right? For what Senghor is about to tell us now with his African version of the individual and the community. Okay, before we get there, anything, any question you need to ask or comments you need to make about anything I said so far? To clarify, before we get into the meat. <laughs> Okay, very good. <clears throat> so African version of the individual and community, two things I'm going to talk about. A, I'm going to talk about the individual <laughs> and B, obviously, community. <laughs> okay, so now let's get into this concept of the subject, right? Remember, we've gone through several different perspectives on what it means to be human, right? We had the Western perspective to be human is to be autonomous individual, to have reason right? Then we have the Jewish perspective. To be human is to be relational, is to be open and permeable to what is happening outside of yourself. African concept, very similar, right, to the Jewish one. To be a subject, right, because, and now here he's the basis here in science, because we are energy, we are naturally connected to everything around us right we talked about this briefly last time if we're just matter right if i take my lipstick i'm sitting here oops i can't put it down putting it here right it's not going to be influenced by the pencil over here right they're just going to stay there not no connection right now if i take the light here's the light <laughs> and then i take my my lipstick you can see how the light is touching is affecting is warming up right the lipstick, the lipstick is not affecting the light, but if I had another light, they would be affecting each other. So to see um, the stuff of humanity as energy, we realize that we are interconnected whether we like it or not. And this is the key. This is the key to the African concept of the subject, because what, and this is the key to the concept we will learn later called Ubuntu, right? Which we'll talk about, but for now, let's put it aside. This is the idea that whatever happens to you happens to me. Whatever happens to me happens to you because, as energies, we are connected. We cannot avoid being connected. If south of the border things are going bad, it's going to affect us, right? 
if north of the border things are going bad, it's going to affect us. We are not, there are no borders. Remember what Buber was saying? The U has no borders? We're there. <laughs> this is exactly right in a different way than what we explained. But this is exactly what Sangor is saying. There are no borders. <laughs> In as much as we are energy, we are constantly in touch with everything in the universe and the universe is touching us. We are permeable, we are open, we are sentient. Uh, look at the, uh, the way he describes. Um, we read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Um, go to page uh, 11, last paragraph, right? When he's talking about negritude. Um, <laughs> okay, King, yes, that's, that's good, yes. But maybe, uh, remember, mass is energy. <laughs> that's my way of escaping what you just said. <laughs> but yes, that, that goes, uh, I think that strengthens his point, absolutely. Thank you, King. Okay, page 11, last paragraph, right towards the second line, because this sentient reason, are you there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay, so now he's talking about different type of reason. The Western reason is discursive, masterful, knows intellectually, imposes its concepts. Here we have a different type of approach to the world. We have sentient reason, which is feeling. You should hear Levinas in the background. The reason which comes to grips expresses itself emotionally through that self-surrender. Here it is, the coalescence of subject and object. They're, they're merged. They're completely, com constantly influenced. Um, uh, through myths, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, the continuing, right? The, um, um, uh, yeah, through myths, by which I mean the archetypal images of the collective soul, above all through primordial rhythms. In other words, we are constantly resonating at the frequency of what is around us. This is rhythm, <laughs> right? You hear music and here you are, now you're going with the beat. This is rhythm, you're sensing the frequency around you synchronize there is a synchronization uh, in other words a sense of communion right this is all he's what all he's describing there is simply the what it means to be human right to be human because you're energy and everything is energy you are constantly connected to everything else around you now there are huge ramifications of this and i want to talk about this a little bit um briefly um Hold on. Yeah. There are ramifications when it comes to uh, knowledge and when it comes to ethics. Actually, there are ramifications when it comes to lawmaking and when it comes to ethics. So let me talk about that a little bit because this is going to apply to us here in our context, right? Let's look at ethics, right? If you're always constantly connected to everything around you, right? Uh, in other words, you are moved by the world. In other words, it is the world which invites you to act. You are moved by the world. You are constantly in a state of responding to the world because you're constantly in connection with the world. You're not separate over here and the world is there and you have a set of rules in your head that you apply to the world, the West, right? You're, you're one with the world. And so whatever the world is asking, you are responding. The world goes here, you go there. The world goes there, you go here. Um, are you seeing how a different kind of ethics is going to arise out of this definition of the human as constantly in resonance with the world? Uh, how will it be different from Kant, for example? How does Kant make ethical decisions? And how would the African mindset make ethical decisions? This is very interesting. Let me see if you get it. So remind me, how does Kant make ethical decisions? What does he, is he, is the world informing his decisions, moral, moral decisions for Kant? Allegri, go ahead. For Kant, it's like a voice in your head that's like influencing your decision. While Sangoris is like the whole world is, is like your decision. So, so like you could play the same way like if i harm someone that should be something that we that should be uh, that shouldn't be allowed because if i harm someone I'm basically harming myself yes, but it comes to you by harming someone you're not treating them as like human yeah, and i think that's good. where it is you're, you're talking about almost two things so i'll step on the first uh, one right it's good it's good um so kant will say i know already within myself what is the right thing to do and no matter what the consequence is I will do the right thing. And we saw the problem with that, right? I don't lie. I never lie. The Nazis come. I'm not going to lie. People are going to die, but I did the right thing, 
right? Or, right, somebody's about to die. Uh, I mean, somebody's threatening my family. I know I shouldn't kill. I don't, I don't budge. Everybody dies. <laughs> but at least I was staying true to my principles, right? The African consciousness doesn't work like that, right? At least according to Senghor. No, you don't have a preset thing in your head of how you should act. You are informed by the world at every moment of how you should act. Let me write this down because this is fundamental, right? You don't have a preset or a, a, a set, you don't have ah, a set of principles. I can't write fast enough on this. A set of principles, right? In your head, already there, right? Preset. You, on the contrary, you are constantly responding to the world as it is shifting, right? So, um, now, this implies something very interesting. It implies that your ethics are constantly going to be shifting with the world. So there is no one set of right and wrong that you always apply, like in the Western concept or even the Christian or Jewish concept, right? You have a set of, you have laws, you apply the laws, no matter what, right? Here there is a notion that, well, you have to move with the world. There will be moments when you are called to respond differently. Let me give you some examples. <laughs> um, in our context, right? Let's take the example of, of gay marriage, right? Actually, I shouldn't tell you. I should just um, think about that one. That's a potential test question, right? How would the West, how is the West approaching right now gay marriage, right? Um, how, ra rather, how, how is the Christian West <laughs> approaching gay marriage? And how would the African consciousness approach it, right? And right there, you can see a very different way of, of, of dealing with ethical issues, right? Instead of having a set, right? These are the laws from the Old Testament that say it's an abomination, therefore it's an abomination at all times, in all places, always, right? Now you have a different way. You have a way, the world is asking me to respond a certain way. Am I going to respond, right? Or, and the world now is asking me to respond a certain way. You see the difference? Everybody sees how this is a very different approach to ethics, right? Uh, put your hand on the screen if you're following me. Um, Right? So instead of having the set of principles that are rigid, and so even though the world is changing, you're not. <laughs> and so you, 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 you end up in situations where you have a lot of pain and suffering or injustice even. Or do you move with the world and respond to the situations as they arise? People want this, people desire this, people need this. What do I do? How do I respond? Right? Uh, yes, King, the constitution with the amendment system was aware that yes, you have some fixed things, but you have to also be able to move with the times if you're going to be truly ethical. And uh, by the way, this is also the Hebrew way of reading the Bible. We are not often aware of that, right? But the Hebrew way of reading the Bible is that we ought to read it, but also interpret it according to the times we live in. So there is an intention of moving the text, right, through the ages and not just sticking with the text that is rigid, right? So, so the African ethics is much more flexible and fluid. Uh, and as such, it falls, it, it escapes, right, the rigidity and the injustice that can arise from too much rigidity, right? So this is interesting already to see the repercussions on ethics on this way of acting in resonance, right? I am constantly connected to the world, responding to the world. And we saw this with Levinas, right? Levinas is saying ethics is response, responsibility, right? Ethics is I feel you and I respond to you. We're in the same place, right? Okay. So that's the first thing that was interesting on the level of ethics, right? We are not like Kant, a priori ethics. We are like Levinas, a posteriori ethics. Let me write this down. Let me, these are important concepts. Um, a posteriori ethics. In other words, a priori means it's before experience. A posteriori is informed by experience. So instead of Kant who said, I know what to do and I apply it to life, uh, Levinas, Senghor would say, no, life is itself telling me what to do. The different circumstances are calling out for a certain response and ethics is responding to that particular call 
which is in existence, not in some scripture or in my preset reason, right? Okay. So that's to give you a little bit of sense of the individual very close to living us. Now let's look at community. And this has interesting ramifications also. Um, so uh, look at the text here on page 16. Okay. The second paragraph, the last line, which we read before, where it says a community-based society, put your hand in the screen. Okay. A community-based society, communal, not collectivist. We talked about that. We are not concerned here with a mere collection of individuals, but with people conspiring together, conspiring in the basic Latin sense, which actually means breathing together, right? So what does it mean to breathe together? <laughs> What kind of society emerges from people who are breathing together, right? That's the question. So what, what Singer is saying here, basically, is that since we are energy, right, and society is energies put together, do we have less energy or more energy when you add energies together? What do we have? If I turn on a lamp and then another lamp and then a third lamp, do we have less light or more light? More light. Okay, very good. Now, so as, right, as the people are coming together, they are actually increasing their energy. Now watch, he's saying this is exactly the opposite of the laws of matter. If this collides with this, they both lose energy. <laughs> you know this, right? The laws of thermodynamics, right? If this collides with this, it slows down and this stops, maybe if they're both moving, right, and they collide, this slows down, this slows down, they lose a little bit of their energy. So in the material realm, when we bring more people, we lose resources, true, but we gain energy. Are you following? This is so interesting because this is precisely the argument against immigration, right? Oh, we don't want more people because they're going to take our resources. This is a material view. But what is Senghor saying are those immigrants bringing? Yeah, they're taking resources, they're taking jobs, they're taking space and air. But what are they bringing based on Senghor? Tell me. Bringing over like humanity, like connection pretty much. Absolutely, more than that, they're bringing energy. Yes. <laughs> right? They're bringing spirit, energy, consciousness, right? So that's the idea. We as a society, because we are materialistic, we see new people coming into the country, we're thinking we're going to have less and less and less resources. This is not a good idea. Let's close the borders. Sangor is saying, are you insane? The more people, the more complex, the more consciousness, the richer you are as a society, right? So what you lose materially, you gain spiritually, right? The more people are there, the more energy comes, the more right? The more fire, the more light, the more consciousness, right? Especially if these people maintain their difference, right? Then they're complexifying. They're growing the organism into something much more bigger and complex and therefore more conscious, right? So this is interesting, right? This view of society and of people coming together, not as a lessening of my, yes, it is a lessening of my resources. Imagine I have a big chunk of land, and now people coming now sharing this chunk of land. Now I have less land. Yes, I have now a tiny, tiny parcel left, right? So I'm losing in terms of material, but I am gaining in terms of this energy and creativity and spirit that is created by all of these people being together, right? Are you following this? Uh, put your hand if you're following. Okay. <clears throat> So you see, we're here again in Chardin, right? You're, you should be hearing Teilhard de Chardin everywhere. He's everywhere, right? This idea of um, bringing together people <clears throat> as forming, as being energetically, um, a, what's the word? Um, ah, as bringing more energy, right? This is an idea from Chardin. Now, there's two more things. Oh my God, I'm running out of time. This is horrible. Okay. So now there's two more things. So two things that we deduce, right, from this view of, of community uh, in the African sense. Number one, when you have more people, you have more consciousness. Yeah, you have less resources, but you have more consciousness. That's the first thing. Make sure you write it down. More people, less resources, yes, but more consciousness. Number two, remember, the people, for this to work, the people have to keep their identity. They have to keep their difference. 
right? In, it, it is in as much as we have complexity, which means many, many, many different entities, right? That we're going to have this consciousness. So the type of society he's envisioning is one where everyone in a way maintains their difference. So this might be a response to you, Hal Murad, who wrote this in your paper, right? Civilization of the universal means doesn't exclude all the particulars, right? He doesn't mean that the particulars merge in the universal. No, the particulars continue to coexist and complexify and therefore bring this higher consciousness. Are you following me, Hal Murad? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but um, not to the full extent, because how could you explain what, what is going on right now in France, for example, with all that conflict that is happening at the moment? You know why there's conflict in France? <laughs> Between the French and the Muslims? I yeah, will please tell explain, you. yeah. <laughs> there is conflict because there is a refusal to admit the Muslim reality. We want everyone to blend and be French, and we want to be French without thinking of the sensibilities of the other, right? In France, we are in complete denial that there is a huge community of Muslims, right? Our dream and our fantasy is that they will all merge and become French, right? So the reason there are so many tensions is because there is a refusal to accept not only the presence <laughs> of Muslims, but to accept the presence of Muslims in their difference, this is something which extremely annoys me in France. I will give you one example. These Muslim women want to go to the beach and they have this, they don't want to wear bikinis, obviously. So they have invented a burkani, which is a very, very modest type of swimwear. It's illegal. The French made it illegal. Why? <laughs> Who cares? Right? So in France, there is such a strong resistance, right, to, to, the, to just even the presence and the presence as well as the difference that is there, that they're creating, in my view, more problems, right? A lot of these issues that you have, these beheadings we have been going through in France, is really not that I'm going to say beheadings, you know, are justified, but, you know, we have really, we are incapable of respecting the sensibility of the, the Muslim community that are living with us, right? We are continuing to be French, <laughs> right? And, and this is not how you coexist, right? We are refusing this coexistence. The reason you don't have so much conflict with the Muslims in the States or in England is that the States, they don't care. Yeah, go wear what you want, worship what you want, and eat what you want. They don't care. But the French, they want everyone to be French. <laughs> it's the Enlightenment ideal, right? We have to be all the same. Socialist country, by the way. <laughs> Not communist, but socialist, right? We want everyone to be French. There are laws in France against wearing anything that identifies you as a Muslim or a Jew or a Catholic. You can't go around wearing a burqa. You can't go around wearing a, what do you call it? this thing, um, the little hat that the Jews wear, I forgot the name, right? You, you have to walk around looking European. Why? Right? So in my view, a lot of the problems that the French are encountering, they produce it. Um, if they were mo more, you know, um, uh, you know, a little more, less uptight about these Muslims being there and less fearful of being somehow invaded, um, there will be less problems in my view. That's my opinion. <laughs> Does that make sense, Hal Murad? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. So it doesn't have, right, this kind of coexistence of many particulars doesn't have to be conflictual, right? In the United States, to be honest, this has been up until now, now it's over, but up until now, right, in the US, we have had this genius of coexisting with different cultures. I mean, look at Queens. You go over here, everyone speaks Hebrew and then Spanish and then Chinese, and nobody has an issue with this, right? This is why we have been, in my view, flourishing as a country, because we are capable of living next to each other without, you know, uh, being allergic to each other's difference. And this is what makes us so diverse and therefore so complex and therefore so conscious, right? We're going downhill now, but up until now, this has been the idea, right? Okay, where was I? Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, so just to respond, right? This idea of the civilization of the universal for Senghor is a civilization where everyone maintains their particularity, right? Um, 
Let's see what King has to say. Uh, yeah, absolutely, right? Um, so yeah, the, the French assimilation is really violent in my view and, and, and un unnecessary. Uh, but yeah, the hate crimes again, right? Hate crimes come from where? It comes from the incapacity to accept the presence of another next to you, right? And it comes, in my view, from the ignorance of how much that other can bring you and bring us as a society. If we see complexification as something good, which is what, this is why I love Chardin. He's seeing the complexification of society as, as a plus, as something which brings us higher consciousness. If we were to understand this in our country, we would welcome complexity and difference and there wouldn't be so much hate crimes because we would realize, yeah, you're taking my job, but you're bringing me consciousness. <laughs> Am I making sense, Larson? Where are you, Larson? Larson. Where'd she go? Oh, um, sorry, I can't type fast enough. But there like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I've just seen a lot of like news and like just videos of people like, and even minorities to other minorities, right? Like, Absolutely. yeah, it's really like I don't like even in Queens or Brooklyn or the Bronx. Like, for example, like there was like this video of like um, just people like getting like I guess like boba tea is like an Asian drink, like. You know <laughs> and then yeah like like a bunch of people a bunch of teens just come in and like literally like set a guy on fire for no reason wow okay this yeah, is so. coming, right you have to understand where that mentality is coming from if you come from a materialistic mentality then yes the foreigners the immigrants are taking away they are they're taking your jobs, they're taking your scholarships, they're taking your funding, they're taking your space and your air, right? Absolutely. But if we see people as energy, they are, and, and therefore understand that they're bringing in more energy, more spirit to the society, you don't, you see what I mean? You don't, you're not so hateful anymore because you realize, oh, that person is bringing me. So the reason we have hate crimes in this country is because we are still thinking from a materialistic perspective that they're taking something from me, right? But if we realize that as energy, they are bringing more consciousness, then we're actually going to be welcoming them. Does that make sense, Larson? Um, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so it's, it's hard to shift, right? We are so used to thinking materially that it's hard to shift and think of everything as energy and, and consciousness, right? But this is what this is what Senghor is inviting us to do, right? So finally, right, to conclude Senghor's dream, right, which is the same as Chardin's dream, is the notion not only of within a society, you know, uh, encouraging the complexification because it brings more consciousness, but in the world, right? Encouraging the cooperation between nations, not the merging, right? Like we're doing now with, uh, you know, everybody's becoming American. <laughs> not that, right? If we can encourage the cooperation of the nations while they retain their individuality, now we're back in this complexification and higher state of consciousness, right? So that's what he's saying. Uh, here, finally, to conclude, right, on page 22, talking, of course, about the contribution of the African continent, right, to the nations, he says this, um, yeah, let's read from 21, let's just read that, and then we'll call it a day. Um, now, about the major role of UNESCO, last paragraph, are you there, of 21, okay. Now about the major role of UNESCO, which is to help build civilization of the universal by bringing the different civilizations together in discussion, all good. It has started to show that the concept of race is a false myth, right? Each civilization is already complex. So now he's even saying negritude is itself a complex, right? Of material, technical, cultural, spiritual values, the fruits of geography, history, and the mingling of ethnic characteristics. So clearly, Right, he's not talking about negritude as a racial thing, but as a, um, a um, an ethnic, right? Um, the product of the mixing of ethnicities. That the great civilizations of antiquity were born at the meeting point of the world's roads, and this is the key, right? All great civilizations were crossroads, and they were encouraging this crossroads mentality. If we want to be a great civilization, we need to 
create this crossroads atmosphere, right? Where everyone is coming to the table with their specific contribution, right? He says this, finally, last but not least, that the civilization of the universal, which is the culmination of socialization, will not be European civilization, right? In either its Eastern or Western force, imposed by force, but biological and psychic miscegenation, a symbiosis of different civilizations, right? That's the ideal, is that every civilization discover its own genius, don't assimilate, but bring that particular genius to the table, right? So beyond the society itself or a country, right? We can have this huge organism, right? Very complex when the nations start to cooperate. Any questions? Good, good. All right. Um, we're out of time anyways. <laughs> so, uh, good. So for next time, we will study Shati, uh, actual philosophy. For now, we've read only his summaries of Senghor, but now we're going to get into his own stuff. So you read the last text that I put um, in the thing and on Blackboard. Uh, it's two chapters, two separate chapters, and we'll be reading about Ubuntu and Serity. These are the two new concepts we'll be studying, but we will see connections, of course, with Senghor. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.